Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Francisca Bunnert, I'm the host today. And here is Maxime, and he is going to talk about coding styles for DSL2. And off to you. Thank you. Then I'll share my screen. So hello everyone, uh, Maxime here. So today I'm doing another style, another talk about like uh, DSL2. This time I will try to focus a bit more about like some uh, coding style recommendation. I will not talk much about syntax, but more about like organization of the code. So yes, quick overview. So first, what has changed with DSL2? Uh, you already know the answer to that, like since it's my second topic, what are modules? And uh, third and last, what I think we should do with that? So to begin like with everything, as usual, this is a disclaimer, like these are my own recommendation. Uh, I think some other people like uh, are agreeing with me on some of these views, but other developers might have like other uh, views on that and we are still trying like to forge the best practice we are still trying like to get to figure out how the like what is easier to read what is easier to understand so it might and it probably will still evolve and we are getting there and i might probably change view on some of these topics but at the moment this is what i think we should do so what has changed with DSL2? So if we follow the Paolo announcement from like two years ago on, uh, on the next four blog, uh, I think like I linked like the whole, uh, the whole blog post, but I, for me, the most important phrase is this one, like a module file is nothing more than an Nextflow script containing one or more process definitions that can be imported from another Nextflow script. So this is what has changed with DSL2 modules. So, and as you guessed, I will be talking about modules a lot in this talk. But what actually does that mean? What is a module? So of course, obviously a module is a module. Uh, if we follow uh, this def the definition that, uh, that we just like saw, a process can be a module as well. A sub workflow can be a module and the workflow can be a module. And they all can be interlinked together, which can be a bit confusing, but actually it's pretty clear. But to get like even clearer, we agreed at NF Core to have like some proper definition. So for us at NF Core, a module is a single atomic process that can be called into like uh, other uh, other script. A sub workflow will be like a few chained modules. And then a workflow is an end-to-end -end pipeline. So with that, I think it's fairly simple. And with this definition, we can decide how we want to organize the code and how we want to do things properly. So I will uh, explain what I think should be done. So for me, I think the code should be easy to read. So that's why it's easy to understand. It's easy to share, easy to modify, and easy to contribute. Because that's what we want. We are all working in uh, open source science. And yes, I think that's what we want. That's what this community is all about. It's about like sharing our code, sharing our work, and working together to achieve like these goals. So for me, that's what is the most important part. So now we are going like for some example. So I followed like uh, the same bit of code, like uh, from the module level till the, to the sub workflow level to the workflow level, just to explain for me how, how each, how, 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 how all should work. So basically, first uh, statement, as we said, like all the call for the process is in uh, modules. That's uh, the NF core repository. So either we can have a, a local module within the pipeline or uh, NF core modules within the NF core repository. So in this case, I'm going to showcase uh, ensemble uh, VIP. Uh, oh, I made a typo here, it's fine. I'm going to showcase the ensemble VIP uh, module. So the code is, fairly simple for like a, a module we have like as usual the tag definition the label that uh, specify like the resources that uh, we can decide on afterwards 
Then we have the virtual environment or the containers that are specified for that. Here we have the input. So as usual for the input, uh, first we have like the actual file that are like depending on the sample that we want to analyze. And then we have the reference file or the reference values that are needed for, for this. Uh, the mandatory one, and then we have all of the optional file. Uh, then we can specify some output. So as usual, we have uh, the version, which is which is what we want in all of our NFCore module, because that way we want to be sure that uh, we can have the possibility that we want. And then in this case, we have some optional output. Otherwise, you can have some regular like output in the case uh, We are doing also a when statement in, uh, in, in, uh, in the NF core module. And then we have the proper part of the script, which actually just calls the tool. And then of course, some uh, extra specification to specify uh, some extra arguments or other uh, part from the from the code. And then at the end, we just specify the version. So this is just the part of the code, which is like modular, because that's what we wanted to do in, F, in uh, NFCore. That way we can share the code with everyone. Uh, then as a companion to that, we have some uh, modular setup in the, in the config, in the config file. So for that particular matter, uh, closures are definitely our best friend. This is what I said like in my last talk and this view hasn't changed into that. So with the closure, you can really like uh, dynamically specify like what you want inside. So at NFCore, we decided to use a custom namespace like uh, ext directive that allow us to have like some specific uh, namespace that we are using. So we are using them for the arguments. Uh, args, args2, args3. We are using them for the prefix. We can even be crazy and use that for when. And then we can also use uh, closure and uh, use other directive at the process level, such as uh, publish dir, which is fairly common to use, uh, I guess. And if you're feeling very, very crazy, you can even go and change the container. And this is, for example, what we are doing at the moment in, uh, in Sarek, still for this module. So here uh, within Sarek, at the moment, I'm uh, I'm having a condition to specify if I want this uh, this selector to be available or not, uh, because otherwise uh, we have some warnings that the, this uh, uh, this process does not exist, and I just don't like to have like a lot of empty warning uh, somewhere. So. This is optional, and I'm hoping we will uh, get rid of that at some point. But here, this is just starting here. So we have a prefix for this uh, for this specific like uh, tool that we want to use. So this is what will happen for this prefix. Here we have some arguments. So here, in this case, it's a bit complicated. But basically, what we do, we have like some basic arguments that will be used in all cases. And then we have some specific arguments that will uh, be dependent of the, uh, of the input uh, parameters that we specify on the command line. So in the end, it's actually fairly simple. We just join all of the arguments together. So this is a list. We join all that and then we trim to get just one single string in the end that we can uh, directly put into the, into the process with the args. Uh, directive. Then, uh, because in Sarek we like to do things like uh, differently, we specify a specific container in that case. And then we are using our uh, publish, di publish dir directive to specify where we want to save our file. So depending on the, the extension of the file, we, have, we might have some specific uh, location for that. And that's all. So in the end, it might look complicated, but it's actually fairly simple. Uh, then at the sub workflow level, so I think we can actually have like several layers of sub workflow. So for me, for like the first layer of sub workflow, I try to keep it like as simple as possible. 
So what I want to do in this level, I just want like to chain module together and just do some tiny channel manipulation if I have to. For example, you need like to remap like uh, the output from one from one, one module to go into another module. Then yes, you can do that at this level. So it will, for example, arrive to that. So this is uh, the sub workflow that I'm using that we are using in Sarek to actually like uh, call uh, the module ensemble bit and then call the tabix module to uh, tabix index uh, the VCF file. So here, this is what we are doing. As usual, for uh, we begin the workflow by taking the, the input data that is related to the sample, and then all of the reference genome and optional values that we need, that we need to, to share. Then here, fairly simple, still I, uh, I call the first module. I call the second module on the output from the first one, and then I emit everything out. And of course, we gather all of the version of all the tools used. So that's still at this case. If I want to go still, we are at the sub workflow, but then it's a fairly higher level because the sub workflow, we can still include other sub workflow in the sub workflow. So what we can do there is that we can chain module together, or we can even like chain sub workflows together, or sub workflows and module, and stuff like that. We can also manipulate channels, and we can do here also what I think is good to do here, and not at any other, and not at a previous level, is to specify some execution logic with some if uh, blocks. So it will look like that. So here in this case. I'm uh, calling three different like sub workflow. Actually, I'm just calling like two different sub workflow. I'm calling the ensemble vid that I just showed, the snip effect, uh, snip f uh, sub workflow, and I'm calling the ensemble vid like uh, twice because one time I want to use it uh, as it is, and one time I want to use it uh, on the output of uh, the other sub workflow. So I need to do an alias to actually be able to use it twice in the same sub workflow. So as usual, I'm using the, it takes as an input the, the files that are related to the sample. And then as usual, the reference data and the other value. Then as I explained earlier, I'm having this uh, if uh, statement to control the execution of the, of the sub workflow. And then I collect uh, all the files that need to be, to be collected. Same thing for that. Same thing for that. And then we emit everything back. So if I think that if we follow this logic, I think we, are, we can get like some fairly easy to read and easy to understand organization of the module, sub workflows, sub workflows. And that way it's easy to understand where to contribute, what to do, how to change and how to evolve stuff. And then at the work level, it's where we can we can do or where I think we should do like everything else. So we can still at the workflow level call a single module. For example, you might want to call just the multi QC module here at the at the workflow level. Uh, of course, at the workflow level, we want to chain several sub workflow because if we don't do that here. Where are we going to do that? And then, of course, you still want to do some channel manipulation because, yes, that's your main workflow script. So that's where you want to do all of the magic. And, of course, the execution logic still happen over there. So this is what happened within Sarek at the moment. So still here, I have my uh, execution logic. If like if some if like my uh, parameters, my input parameters are, are right, then I'm going to do that. And here, I just call my uh, sub workflow within the within the main workflow, and I gather all of the uh, all of the use software version and the report that I that I need to have. And then that's all. So for me, this is how we should really like organize uh, our code uh, for the module, depending on if we are at a module level, at a sub workflow level, or at a workflow level. Uh, I also have like some small uh, syntax like recommendation. We are trying like to actually make uh, a 
proper recommendation guidelines on the DSL2 syntax. So we are working on the document with uh, several other people uh, from NFCore. So if you want to contribute, like the link is, uh, is in the title here. And what I would like to say is first, like indentation is your friend. I think that's like a fairly good statement. And uh, I think like a lot of people that are coming into bioinformatics uh, will learn to code with Python. So I think indentation is already like uh, deeply ingrained into your our habit. So let's continue working on that and let's keep indent. It makes the code like nice to look at. And I like to have like a nice code to look at. Uh, then I think, yes, in a process, uh, I saw like several different uh, way to call, a to, to collect like several files just to call it like uh, with the same parameters. And I think this is like a proper way to do so. Um, I try like to enforce that in all of the JTK4 modules. Uh, but that might have escaped to me like in some point. So this is like, I think, fairly... Uh, small and it's a, it's a small one liner that is, I think, easy to understand. Uh, then I think for the channel uh, assignments, that's, that's something that you want to do in a sub workflow or in, or in a workflow. I personally prefer like to assign the, to specify which channel I want to assign things to first. But some other people might prefer to have like the, the channel in the end. I personally prefer the first version. Uh, I can see that some people coming from an R world prefer the second one. Uh, I think we really need like to figure out with the community what we want to do, but uh, I think I'm fairly like uh, going towards like uh, the first version of, of this line. Uh, some last I think tips like uh, before I open the discussion. So please add comments to your code. It's good for you good for your colleagues or anyone who are going to have a look at the code. It's also good for future you because yes, believe me, like two weeks from now or like uh, three months from now, you're going to look again at your code and you're not going to remember why you did that. So you want some comments and right now you're your own best friend. You should be able like to help yourself and do that. Uh, also, I think it might be important. I notice this like uh, sometimes uh, within Nextflow, it might be difficult to differentiate between like queue and value channels. And I think it could be like a good idea to help to have that difference like in mind from the beginning when you design your pipeline. Usually we do use value channels for uh, reference for all the reference files. And sometimes Sometimes you don't understand why your uh, process is not executed several times. It's because this channel that you believe was a value channel is actually a queue channel. So we need to be careful with that. Otherwise, I think like a good tips would be like, don't hesitate to ask questions. We have Slack, we are available on that. And uh, I personally like, like to discuss with other people and stuff. So discuss that's good and uh, yes if uh, you're on site with other people have a fika that's always a uh, coffee break that's always good with uh, to start discussion with anyone else so yes as usual i'd like to thank like uh, all of the institution i work for and all of the institution like uh, we work uh, like I work for and with on uh, on my project. I'd like to thank all of the institutions that are working with us on NFCore. And I would like to thank all of the contributors that we had uh, so far at the moment on NFCore as well. Uh, if you need some help, of course, uh, Slack as usual or everything else. Uh, if you need more help, we have some uh, documentation and uh, we have some previous bite size that you can check up or that. Otherwise, I'm open for a question. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. I don't seem to show. Um, anyway, I have now opened the possibility for everyone to unmute themselves. So if you have any questions, um, otherwise we have also questions in the chat. Okay, let's begin with a question in the chat. Um, there was a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I do have a question. Oh yeah, um, go ahead. Okay, so I guess this will be my first question, which is, uh, I'm wondering which specific Slack channel discusses Sarek. 
in the NF core workspace. Because I haven't found any, if there's any specific one for Sarek or it's just one of the existing channels. No, no, no. We have a specific like Sarek channel to discuss to discuss about Sarek. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a specific like channel for each pipeline and we do have like specific channel for every for every main topics. Otherwise, whenever you don't know anything, don't stay to go to the help channel and then we will direct you toward like the right channel. Okay. So it's like hash Sarek or something like that, right? Uh, yes, hash, uh, hash Sarek. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, I found it. Thank you. So my other one is more of a comment as a follow-up to what somebody said about uh, the last comment about a user of a pipeline, uh, DSL one or two are not really important. However, as a developer, as a developer it matters. And yes, DSL one to two conversion is a lot of work. So I tend to disagree with the first part of that, which says um, as a user, DSL one or two are not really important. It is important because people are forced to actually um, go back to their code for those that actually did a DSL one without specifying which, uh, how their code should run. Since next row pretty much just force people by defaulting to DSL two and the code breaks, people are now forced to revisit their work. So if it wasn't that important, even for a user, then that would not be necessary. So I would tend to disagree and say it is in fact important to have uh, pipelines in DSL to whether it, it, it works in DSL one or not is relevant at this point. Because unless if you know you were thinking about the fact that DSL two will be default when you were coding and then you had made it very clear in the each each of your modules or if each each of your scripts that it was DSL one enabled and stuff like that, right? So I just wanted to point that out. But thanks, that was a great talk. Thank you. There's also a question from Matthias. Okay, let's go. Yes, thank you for your great talk. Um, could you please elaborate a bit more on the extra arguments? Because I noticed, for example, that you wrapped them in brackets in your module example. Uh, yes, let me go back to that. That's chick, 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 chick. And I haven't seen that so far no yeah. further back. That was that or not at all? No. Um, yeah. Sorry. Here then in the module? No, no, it was, was part of the code. Um, where where you had the so not this one either, right? Uh, could it be? No. Uh, is it? Sorry, I'm going. I'm trying to find it back. No, not this one. It, it must be the, co the the config where you provide the extra arguments. Um, yeah, that's what I see. Uh, are you saying like the for the published deer thingy? I uh, know exactly here, exactly here. The the params dot web, web log tree or something. You you wrap them here in brackets. Ah, yes. And so here, what we are doing, so we have everything like all of this X arg is in brackets. So that's a wall list. Yeah, that agree is, on that. That's, okay. That's a list, but the that's parents, a list. And, and then you um, uh, uh, not brackets, braces. Yeah, no, no, it's, no worries. It's fine. I, I always like uh, confuse uh, the name of this, like even in French. So. No worries. So yes, here it's a list. And for each element of this list, I specify like either like directly the, the params or directly here I have a tertiary like if, if, which is a bit long, sorry, which helps me specify, okay, if, sorry, I'm going back there. So if this statement is true, then I have like this first uh, string that will be considered. Otherwise, it will be like the second string, which is an empty string. Okay. Yeah. That, that's and and, and the volume then because, row, and, because and you basically just have the braces because for consistency. So if you don't evaluate the the end, then it doesn't matter whether it's in braces or not. Hmm. Or, or or is that is there? No, no. I think the bracket like the bracket are important because otherwise if we don't have that then it's not a list and I want my, basically what I want is that I have several arguments 
I could make like one uh, complicated if like getting like all of the different like stuff. But what I want is that I want one string on which I can append like other argument on top of that. This, this is completely clear. I, I'm just wondering about the notations because sometimes it's it's like you you wrap uh, curly braces still around. This is when you have a meta map in there. This ah, is okay. You mean like that here? And uh, no, um, no. But probably we should just take this. Uh, yes, let's take, let's take this. Somewhere. There should be like some uh, easy solution, some easy stuff for that. He's Sorry. talking about when to use a closure. So the ah. closure uh, that's, for example, used in ext prefix, um, the it when you use a closure, the variables are um, evaluated during the task task execution. But if you don't, so for example, the ext args, um, this one doesn't have the the curly braces, so this is not within a closure, and you can't use any variables from the task execution context. And it's evaluated uh, as soon as the the config is loaded. Um, so right at the beginning of the workflow before any of the um, tasks are executed. But if you use a closure, then one, you can access variables within the task con uh, context, so anything from input. Um, but also it means that kind of things like params dot um, uh, out there and whatever, um, their uh, their their evaluation is delayed until the execution of the task. Thank you, Mesh. Yeah. Um, yes. No. No. You understand what was the question? Sorry, I misunderstood you. I, I, I didn't to make make myself clear, but I, it's it's still a big mystery in a bit to me in this regard here. The the details. Yes, yeah, then don't worry, we, we can have like a more detailed talk about that another day. Then there's a question from Phil. Oh. Hi everyone, thanks for the talk, Maxime. Um, <clears throat> no, I just wanted to reiterate something that came up in the comments on Zoom just now, mostly in case anyone's watching this on YouTube at a later date. Um, it was a really good comment about DSL 1 and 2 and how running a DSL 1 pipeline with newer versions of Nextflow will crash in a slightly nasty way. But um, just to note that that's actually only a fairly specific version of Nextflow where that happens. So Paolo switched it to DSL2 by default. We saw these crashes happening. So we spoke to spoke to him and now the newer versions of Nextflow since version uh, 22.04.3 um, should automatically detect whether the workflow is DSL1 or DSL2. So you can go back to just running it without any flags and it should just work whether it's DSL1 or whether it's DSL2. No nasty crashes anymore. But uh, will, will, uh, will we keep like uh, DSL1 inside the, the main next floor or at some point will we com completely discontinue it? At some point it will be completely discontinued. So in, in the future, I think it's sometime, it's mentioned in the next row blog, but I think yeah, it's planned for some time. About that, but I don't remember the details exactly. Yeah, I think it's planned for kind of mid-2023. The released versions of Nextflow will stop supporting DSL1. And from that point, any DSL1 pipelines will have to be run with older versions of Nextflow. Yes, but then it's still fine because we can still install older version. Exactly. Yeah, so the workflows will still run, just not with the latest version of, of Nextflow. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in converting workflows into DSL2, uh, then we have a Slack uh, channel in NF Core dedicated to this topic called uh, DSL2 hyphen transition. Um, and the same goes also for sub workflows. Sorry. Uh, thank, thank you, Phil. Uh, there's another question from Olaitam. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, good. I'm going to make it brief. So, my actual question is to Sarek again, which is that if I know, so you guys basically need to, for the reference genome, it has to be one of the existing ones, maybe GRCH 38, 37, and the likes, right? So, if I have a scientist, right, who has his, who has her own um, reference genome, basically, right, which is not one of the, you know, standard types. How do I handle the situation? Uh, then it's fairly simple. We have these uh, parameters that you can choose uh, within Sarek. But uh, can we talk about that more in, in, in the Sarek? Yeah. For sure, for sure, this is going to be a long talk for sure. Thanks. Yeah. No, no, no worries. Just like don't say to ping me on, on Slack and I will answer okay. to you. 
the direct link was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions from the audience? There is a question potentially. Ah, oh, no. Uh, Phil also posted a link um, to Nextflow IO. It's the Nextflow blog post talking about the end of DSL1 support. I'll right. put it in Slack as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, earlier, Mahesh um, posted a link to uh, Carpentry's training material. For coding practices, I will also leave this link in this lecture. Yes, that's slides. good. Maybe I can include that in my slides as well. Yes. Okay, if there are uh, no more questions from the audience, um, thank you so much, Maxime, for the talk. Thank you. And uh, I also would like to thank um, the Chen and Zuckerberg Initiative for funding these talks. And um, as always, you can continue these talks in. Um, in Slack under hashtag bite size or specific to uh, any of the channels uh, for different workflows. And uh, thank you very much.